take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Banerjee, President of the Indian Society of Human Genetics, for organizing this important meeting because, uh, uh, you know, on the podium of uh, the Indian Society of Human Genetics, we normally don't have too many talks on um, post pathogen genome interaction. So uh, I thank him for uh, organizing this, uh, this meeting. Uh, I also will take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Chandrabhas Narayana for providing us uh, the platform uh, from which to host this meeting. And the Institute of Human Genetics is very grateful uh, to RGCB for um, providing this platform. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Professor Saraswat and in absentia, uh, Professor uh, Marte for um, inaugurating this uh, symposium. And uh, it, was, it was very nice to hear uh, Dr. Salaswar um, provide us with an uh, overall view of uh, host genome interactions and what India is supposed to do. Um, I also welcome all of the um, all, all of our um, you know, uh, members of the Indian Society of Human Genetics and uh, uh, for, for for participating in this uh, meeting. So let me make my screen full screen, and I hope that you will be able to see. It's, uh, the internet is somehow very slow. Uh, it's moving on here, so I don't know. I hope that uh, it will be fine. Yeah. Uh, is it screen mount? Uh, is my screen full screen? Are you able to see me? Yes. Yes, yes. We can see yeah, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'll begin my talk. I might talk about that in my talk. And Sprints and Hops, the completed global journey of a mutant SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Um, I'm not going to explain the first phrase, Sprints and Hops, as I go along, um, that will become very clear. Uh, in some ways, this is, this is a same talk, in the sense that uh, I'm talking about the global journey of a mutant uh, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, but I'm also saying that the journey has been completed. And why am I then presenting this talk? Uh, the, the talk indeed that the journey has been completed, but uh, this, this particular um, work that we did and that I'm presenting to you uh, has served some ramifications, has have some conceptual uh, interest in terms of understanding host genome, um, uh, host pathogen interaction, especially as the pathogen is trying to infect more and more uh, hosts and spread its way to the to the world. Um, and then, like I said, strength and hops will become uh, clear as we go along. Uh, I'm from the uh, yeah, I'm from the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, and this is uh, this is really the uh, building of our institute in Kalyan, which is a uh, uh, forty kilometers north of Kerala. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm going to run out, run out of time, and therefore I'd like to begin with um, uh, acknowledgments. Uh, this entire work was done by a whole bunch of students and uh, colleagues. Uh, Nidham Biswas is really the pillar of this uh, particular work that I'm going to present to you, both in terms of ideas and also in terms of uh, guidance provided to the baby students uh, who actually carried this work out. Um, uh, so uh, I just get the privilege of presenting the work, but it's essentially been done by Nidham. Uh, so I, I wish to thank all of them for enabling me to present. Uh, I'm going to uh, quickly uh, run through what what, uh, what had happened uh, during the pandemic, uh, kind of a timeline. Uh, so it all started in 2019, in December of 2019, as uh, most of you will remember. It started with a cluster of 27 pneumonia-like cases of unknown etiology in Wuhan. Uh, Wuhan is very famous for its seafood market and also for its international um, um, international platforms where very many international um, uh, organizations uh, conferences that held. Uh, so on January 1st, the Wuhan's um, seafood market, wholesale market, was actually closed. Um, on January 7th, the novel coronavirus was uh, isolated. This is really something that we must have thought that in a very short period of time uh, from an infection, the actual positive uh, agent was uh, uh, identified and it was identified to be a coronavirus, which was unknown at that time. So it was a novel coronavirus that actually. Uh, the genome sequence was uh, genome sequence was done in a in a record time of three days, as one can see. So the, the coronavirus genome was sequenced in three days. Uh, the first case it traveled out of China. Um, uh, the first case outside of China was reported in Thailand, and that that was in January 13, 2020. 
the Wuhan, uh, aside from the, uh, the Wuhan city, aside from the seafood market, like I said, also has a wonderful international uh, conference platform where lots of people from um, outside the world, uh, from various parts of the world, come into China. And uh, so it, it facilitates the, the, the movement of people, facilitates the movement of these kinds of infections uh, from, from, from one place to another. And in this case, um, within about 15 days of its appearance, it actually traveled outside. Uh, the, um, that it was, that it is a human to human transmission it wasn't very clear, but uh, the announcement was made in January 20th that of the human to, that uh, humans could transmit, that one human could infect another human. Uh, this outbreak that started in Wuhan was declared uh, by the World Health Organization as a public health emergency of international concern because it had already uh, moved outside of China and was infecting people outside of China as well. And uh, on March 11th, which is about uh, uh, two and a half months after uh, the first outbreak arose, the World Health Organization declared uh, COVID-19, which is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, as a, as, a, as a pandemic. And um, so, so it, it became a major global concern. Um, like Dr. Sarasvat and others have pointed out, uh, in excess of 4 million deaths, close to 5 million deaths have happened. Uh, but uh, the number of global infected cases uh, is uh, uh, huge. And in some ways, uh, the coronavirus is a very kind virus. It doesn't, this novel coronavirus is a very kind virus in the sense that it doesn't uh, kill too many people. It infects hugely. It's capable of huge amounts of infection, but it kills about 2%, point, about 2 of the people that it infects. These are the leading countries, US, India, India ranks two and has retained its rank for, uh, for a very long time, uh, second position in terms of global number of cases, and that's not something to write home about, but uh, the USA has been leading the fact, India is the second, followed by the UK, but then the other countries are, um, you know, take, take different kind of positions as time goes on. Uh, Brazil was uh, sort of uh, towards the top, but now has uh, so anyway, the, the, the level of infection, the, the number of people infected in various cities in the world uh, have changed over the period of time, but, um, and, and it's, uh, it's not infecting too many people right now, but uh, the number of global cases is really high, but the number of deaths has not been so much. Um, even though 5 million deaths globally is a huge number, but in terms of the number of people infected and the proportion of deaths as a result of that infection is uh, kind of small. Um, this is the single standard SARS CoV 2 is a single standard sense virus, um, uh, sense RNA virus, positive sense RNA virus uh, of about 30,000 bases. And please remember that these 30,000 bases were sequenced in a record time of three days, uh, thanks to the uh, enormous uh, advancements in genomic technology, genomic sequencing technology. Um, this, uh, this virus has uh, 29 structural and non structural proteins. Uh, of which uh, one one particular protein has attracted the attention of all of us, which is the spike black 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 protein, and uh, many of the drug targets are on this uh, black protein, and I'll have uh, something to say about the spike black black protein. Uh, uh, if we look at uh, the evolutionary descent of this uh, coronavirus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 actually uh, has its predecessor as ancestors uh, has. Um, uh, you know, previous previous uh, outbreak, uh, not of the same, but related uh, coronavirus. So the uh, previous coronaviruses, like the bat coronavirus, the pandemic coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-1, that uh, you know infected uh, China or you know, the one now of China that was contained in China that was contained that happened in 2014. Uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus that infected many people and killed many people. Um, in, in the Middle East in 2013, and of course, uh, the common cold coronavirus uh, is with us um, you know, for, for a very long period of time. There has been a lot of controversy, but also a lot of research done on whether uh, this was an animal to human transmission or whether it was invented or uh, leaked out of a, uh, of a lab in Wuhan. Uh, the jury is still out there, but the uh, evidence, the immediate uh, evidence, the genomic evidence points to this. Uh, transmission from uh, animal to uh, human uh, via the animal from back to human via the animal. Um, so uh, if you look at, uh, I'm going to, uh, so these are the short uh, amino acid sequences that I'm displaying to you. Uh, 
uh, as you will see that I have marked a particular position called 614 and it's called D at that particular position and you will just remember that this is D at that particular position from uh, bat coronavirus, family coronavirus uh, and previously human coronavirus. That's why the, at that particular amino acid position 614 we want as a D and we will come back to this uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Uh, as all of us know, viruses cannot survive without their host, so there is obviously an interaction going on between the viral genome and the host genome. Uh, to replicate, they have to enter host cells and use, use the host cell machinery for them uh, to be able to survive and replicate. Uh, so in some ways, the viruses don't want to kill their hosts, because if the hosts get killed, they also uh, vanish, uh, they, because they, they cannot live outside of the host, and certainly they cannot uh, replicate the uh, the host mortality has been pretty low for the SARS, normal SARS, normal SARS for the flu. Uh, I said it's about 2%, uh, but uh, previous SARS coronaviruses, it was more. Uh, particularly uh, of concern was the Middle East respiratory coronavirus that killed 34 of the 100 people that uh, infected from an average. The SARS cov one killed about 11 of the 100 people that is, uh, that, that is infected. And SARS cov 2, like I said, is killing. Uh, two of the other people that uh, the remaining 19 people actually recovered. However, the disease burden has been uh, quite high because people are uh, suffering and uh, lots of hydrated oxygen uh, and so on and so forth. So management of SARS-CoV-2 has been a major challenge uh, in spite of the fact that not too many people die of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. If you look at uh, the phylogeny of the SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, it, it, the uh, a detailed reading of the phylogeny actually convinces us that you know this, this is for example starts for two and then you find the bat and the pangolin very close to uh, the, uh, this particular uh, branch of this phylogenetic tree. In other words, the starts for two genome is very similar to the bat genome, a uh, bat coronavirus genome and the pangolin coronavirus genome. Again, testimony to the fact that it's most likely a crossover from uh, from the animal to the human. And then after the human to human transmission is what's making it spread or what has made it spread so, uh, so well. The uh, SARS CoV 2 has a certain preference uh, in, in terms of organs and host cell types. It, it, uh, it preferentially goes and infects the lungs, and in the lungs, there are various kinds of cells. It preferentially uh, infects the type 1 and type 2 neocytes, uh, also the alveolar macrophages, and so on. So, 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 so uh, essentially, there are certain organs, uh, the lung being the um, favorite, then there is the nasopharyngeal area, the throat, uh, and, and the sputum. Well, it also gets shed in the sputum and the throat and the stool. Um, so, um, the, the, it, it, it doesn't infect all organs, but it, has, it is restricted to certain organs and it is restricted to certain cell types within that organ. And this also has taught us about uh, you know, how to be for the drug for. Um, Drug and vaccines against coronavirus or COVID 19. Uh, the, the protein that's, uh, that has attracted a lot of attention is, uh, looks beautiful, as you can see from this. It's very flowery, and that's the spike protein um, that, that culprit that actually is uh, The spike protein plays a key role in the receptor recognition and cell membrane fusion process. It is the, the virus. Particle has to enter uh, the human host cell to be able to replicate and uh, the spike protein to the role. Actually, the spike protein is composed of two subunits. Uh, it's called subunits one and two, S1 and S2. And uh, these are uh, attached, and when they are attached, they, they essentially are neutral. They don't, don't uh, cause any damage or uh, do any kind of function. The S1 subunit contains a receptor binding domain. That recognizes the host receptor uh, and the uh, recognition is of the host uh, receptor called angiotensin synthetic enzyme 2 or, or ACE2. Uh, and again, I'll have something to say about ACE2 when, it, when I talk about its interaction with the host. So that's how it interacts. It actually attaches the cell bind, recognizes and binds to the host receptor. So that's the uh, uh, immediate uh, uh, interaction that the virus particle has with uh, the, the host. The S2 subunit then uh, facilitates once it binds to the cell surface, it needs to enter in that S2 subunit essentially uh, facilitates the fusion of the viral membrane with the cellular membrane in the host. So that, that's how. So using the, the two components, the two subunits 
of the um, S spike protein, the virus is able to first attach itself to the host cell wall and then break the host cell wall and enter uh, the um, human host cell. And once it enters, it starts to replicate the uh, hijacking the cellular machinery of the human host. Um, the host cell partner that facilitates SARS CoV 2 to enter. Uh, there is a protein called Tempris 2 uh, that the serine protein. A protein usually chops up proteins, and so this serine protein is uh, um, useful to the virus. And that's, that's another point. Uh, I talked about ACE2, and I'm now talking about Tempris 2, which is a serine protein that actually helps the, helps the virus enter the human host cell. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of there's a cascade of activities that go on, but uh, that's really not. Uh, our focus uh, today and our focus is more on the uh, interaction and the genetic interaction that takes place. Um, so, if you, so that, that's kind of the prelude, that's kind of the preliminaries, and we'll uh, come back to these preliminary uh, concepts and uh, facts in a few minutes. But um, there are two major uh, sequence databases that we have all studied. Everybody knows about these two databases called the ILCID, which is essentially started as an influenza database. And initially, it wasn't even known what this coronavirus was doing. So they started, uh, uh, the, the influenza database started putting the uh, coronavirus genome sequences in the same database. And that has continued uh, like a legacy. And then there is the next strain database, which is essentially uh, a curated database from the ILCID. And also has some value addition to the uh, to the raw raw sequences. So these are the two databases that we all have studied in order to understand uh, um, how this particular coronavirus has spread. And this is again, uh, like I said, that this is a completed journey. So the, the work has not continued beyond a certain time point. Essentially, uh, about uh, September of last year is when we stopped doing this work because we had gotten uh, some answers to the questions that we had started to ask. But as you can see, that it has uh, a 19th October, uh, uh, no, uh, 3rd October 2019 uh, to about 22nd April 2020. This has been the spread, and as you can see, that it is uh, spread uh, very rapidly. The estimate, and, and uh, as it spread, as the coronavirus spread, it uh, replicated inside the human host cell when the DNA changes in the virus took place, mutations took place. And a mutation, the, because the virus replicates many, uh, replicates very rapidly, these uh, changes also uh, accumulate, and the virus has been estimated about 24 substitutions, nucleotide substitutions per year. Uh, and, and that nucleotide substitution rate uh, from, uh, has slowed down primarily because the global spread of the coronavirus has also slowed down, so the rate has, uh, has slowed down also. Um, we, um, this, is, this is a publication from the Indian Journal of Medical Research. This was published in May 2020. I just showed you the data up until uh, April 22nd, 2020, and uh, um, that, that's, that's the period when we uh, analyzed the data and gave certain conclusions. Um, the, uh, what we did was to uh, analyze our sequence data of about 4,000 or 2,500 SARS CoV 2 genomes that were collected from 55 different countries. Uh, and it reveals to us that there was a selective sweep of one virus type. And that's the virus type that I'm going to talk about. And uh, the selective sweep is a uh, sweep due to natural selection. That's what we will talk about. Um, uh, so this, this, was, this was kind of requested by uh, the DG uh, ICMR uh, as he heard the story and said that uh, you know, idea, the Indian Journal of Medical Research is coming up with a special issue on sars cov 2 and so we invited us to submit this paper, and that's what we uh, submitted. Um, this was good because it, it, it came, came in an Indian journal, and we were actually racing with uh, um, other groups in the world, uh, but we beat them all. So we were first to discover uh, this particular phenomenon that happened. And I'll tell you a, a little bit about the phenomenon. So the two other groups was one uh, group in Iceland uh, that, that, was also, that also had uh, identified this phenomenon, but and also came to the same, same conclusion, but uh, they published their paper in the Indian Journal in June, on June 11th. Uh, and the second group was a UK US combined group uh, that uh, published their paper in Cell in July 2020. Um, so so the, 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 we, uh, we are the first people in the world to have discovered. So let me tell you what the company was talking about. So I told you about this position 614. Um, that had uh, that had to be at that particular 
division with the amino acid is that division. D is an acronym or a single letter um, amino acid code for ascorbate uh, or ascorbic acid. Um, so that's the 600 position where uh, most of the states of the phylogenetic. So these states are, um, you know, the accumulation of mutations, etc. Various states evolve over a period of time, but can be also different kinds of mutations to place that led to different states. But at the position 6.4, every state had uh, expert aid. But for two states, one state was C2 and the other state was a related state called A2. So essentially, the A2 state uh, had uh, a substitution, uh, a mutant nucleotide substitution that led to an amino acid substitution from aspartate to glycine. And uh, let's see what happened over, over the course of time. So there were multiple claims, there were multiple, I wouldn't call them as strains, but essentially um, subtypes of the coronavirus. So there were multiple subtypes, but one particular subtype caught our attention, and that's what uh, we latched on to in order to find a phenomenon. Uh, global spread phenomenon. So this is what happened on 31st March 2020. So this is about uh, on the right hand side of this. This is a phylogenetic case circular. Um, and so on the and, and each each dot uh, at the end, each um, uh, leaf at the end represents a DNA sequence of the coronavirus. So this is really a relationship uh, uh, among a large number of coronaviruses, about 3,500. Well, no, so this is about 2,000 coronaviruses. Sequences in um, uh, on on 31st of March 2020, and as you can see that uh, uh, on the right hand side, it's all they all belong. That's one large branch of this phylogenetic tree, and all of the leaves of that particular branch belong to either A2 or A2B. Uh, so essentially, one one particular tree. On the other hand, the left hand side, there are multiple branches, and different branches uh, belong to different kinds of trees. So essentially what it meant told us is that when the A2A or A2, that particular phase developed uh, or evolved, then it started to uh, you know, uh, sweep through the uh, remaining period, sweep through the different parts of the world and overtake all of the uh, other phases, some of which um, had, had uh, occurred prior to the appearance of this particular uh, phase. So this is 31st March 2020, a little over 50, 50% of all humans infected with the coronavirus will have this particular uh, type of subtype of coronavirus. Uh, the other remaining 50% will definitely. Uh, this is early May 2020, as you can see, it's already 80%. Um, 80% is APA and remaining uh, are um, the other, other uh, subtypes of the coronavirus. So it's like the APA is uh, keeping over sweeping through different parts of the world and overtaking all the proportions of all of the uh, other states. Um, in July, uh, this is what it is. It's more, it's about 90%. So essentially what's happening is that it's just sweeping across this one particular phase, the one particular subtype is sweeping over uh, the other um, other phase or other subtype. And the question is, why is it able to sweep over? What is this? So this is a selected sweep. This particular coronavirus must have a selective advantage uh, as a result of which it's able to uh, infect more and more individuals um, uh, compared to or uh, more and more individuals because of its ability to uh, infect them better and it's overtaking all of the other states. So uh, if you look at, uh, um, you know, this is, this is about that same time, this is July 2020, and uh, on the x-axis you have different months and different dates. So this, this spans the period December 2019 to July 2020, and there are two um, two rectangles here, one pertaining to Europe and one pertaining to North America. Uh, what, what it presents to you is the proportion of individuals infected with that 614G, meaning the A2A or the A2 subtype, uh, compared to the remaining subtype. So this is the proportion of that human subtype uh, that's uh, spreading to uh, Europe and North America. So as you can see, that initially uh, the um, this particular subtype was not so prevalent, did not infect so many people, either in Europe or North America. And that was like February, uh, around even around February 20, um, it, it, it did not infect that many people. But as you can see that uh, over a period of over a short period of time, uh, many more people got infected and by about July, 100% of people infected in Europe and North America um, were infected with this particular subtype, uh, the 614G. 
614E. Remember that most of the, all of the other subtypes have uh, D at that 614 position. This particular subtype has glycine at that particular position. Uh, when we look at, we didn't have too much of data from South Asia or from Southeast Asia, but we did collate uh, from East and Southeast Asia uh, the data. And as you can see, that during that period of time, during the same period of time, uh, even though the first uh, case traveled outside, uh, uh, traveled from China to outside of China and was first detected in Thailand, which is in uh, Southeast Asia, so it's not like it is a late uh, entrance uh, to the Southeast Asian population, it's an early entrance. In spite of that, as you can see here, in the same time period, uh, this, this particular subtype of the coronavirus is uh, not being so successful in East Asian populations, in populations of East Asia. So, uh, in, in um, populations of Europe, in the Caucasian populations of Europe and North America, the, uh, um, uh, this, this particular mutant coronavirus, the 614G mutant coronavirus, is able to make a sprint. It's sprinting along over time and uh, it's reached 100% uh, quickly. While uh, in East Asian and South, Southeast Asian populations, it's only able to hop, as you can see, because the, the uh, frequency of the proportion of people or the number of people who are infected with the mutant coronavirus is going up and down over time. So that's a sprint in the hop, and the question that we now ask is, why is it uh, sprinting through the Caucasian populations and is uh, unable to sprint through the mongoloid populations of uh, East and Southeast Asia? Um, this was also noted um, that uh, it, was, it was actually uh, noted by reporters. Reuters reported that uh, Asian coronavirus cases reached 250,000, but this is much slower than the USA and Europe. So it's essentially they have observed that it was not uh, sprinting and it was uh, moving much slowly. Uh, the Reuters report also stated that the region where COVID-19 pandemic started has fared better overall than North America and Europe since the first case was reported in Wuhan, China on January 10, 2020. It has taken Asia almost four months to reach 250,000 infected milestone, a level that Spain alone is approaching in just a little over two months uh, since reporting its first case. So as you can see that the rate of spread in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, was much slower than its rate of spread in, um, in Europe and North America. Uh, which is uh, predominantly Caucasian population. Uh, we did some modeling of this. I will not get into this. And what uh, essentially what we showed is that uh, the slope of uh, increase, the slope of the curve that uh, increases uh, in the pandemic was uh, at a much smaller, uh, lower slope in East and Southeast Asia than in North America and Europe. But both would eventually catch up. Uh, Europe and North, uh, East Asian uh, populations would also be um, full with uh, this particular uh, mutated coronavirus, the mutation being at uh, 614 positions from Aspen age to uh, So the next question that we ask is, why is the coronavirus finding it difficult to sweep through the non-location populations of East Asia? Um, we recall that the spike protein latches on to DC protein on uh, the cell surface to get the entry, the angiotensin converting enzyme, um, it latches on to that particular protein uh, uh, on the cell surface to gain entry. It's quite possible that in the non location populations don't have uh, as many protein, uh, as much uh, as, as much expression of the protein on the cell surface as a result of which uh, a smaller number of viruses would be able to latch on uh, to gain uh, entry, latch on to the cell surface and be able to gain entry. So that's a possibility. And that possibility can happen if the uh, AC gene has a mutation in non Caucasian populations uh, that uh, leads to a reduction in the extent, uh, in the extent of uh, protein expression of this particular protein expression on the cell surface. Uh, so we looked at uh, the AC protein, and the AC protein indeed has a large number of uh, mutations, large number of polymorphisms, including in certain position polymorphisms. Polymorphisms in the promoter region, polymorphisms in the gene body, uh, many of them uh, amino acid ordering, etc. etc. However, uh, although some of these variants uh, have impacted on, do impact on uh, NCE expression levels, but one doesn't find any significant difference between the Caucasian and non Caucasian populations in the frequencies of these variants, including the promoter variants. So we did a, um, a detailed study, and I, I'm not presenting the data, uh, but uh, we did not find any significant difference in the proportion 
terms of these various Caucasians and non Caucasians. So the difference that we are observing between the Caucasian and non Caucasian populations in respect of the spread of this coronavirus cannot be attributed to the differences in, 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 in uh, frequencies of these uh, uh, polymorphic marks. Um, so the, the other thing that I said is that uh, uh, this is E, uh, the histone uh, protein needs to be E, and the spike protein is in, uh, inactive until this one and this two protein is associated. And the cleavage is done by two, um, two proteins. One, well, one protein, which is called Dempress 2, uh, which I've already alluded to. So the Dempress 2, 2 protein um, uh, is a host protein that helps uh, cleave the S1 and S2 and uh, activate the two, two uh, subunits of the protein. Um, when there is the 614G mutation, that particular mutation um, uh, actually increases another cleavage site which is a purine cleavage site. So when you have, uh, when, there, when an individual has, instead of D, when an individual has G, that individual has, in addition to the temperance uh, two site, another cleavage site uh, that's, uh, that, that's uh, uh, cleaved by another protein called purine. Again, a host protein called purine. So essentially, if uh, an individual has uh, the, the uh, white site, um, white stack nucleotide or white stack amino acid, which is the aspartate, uh, as opposed to the uh, mutant uh, um, amine, which is um, uh, the glycine in that position, individuals who have glycine would have an advantage, uh, the, the virus would have an advantage to enter the host cell because the host cell has now two cleavage sites and it would permit faster and easier entry of the virus into the host. So this is uh, uh, what we reckon, and then what we start to look at is, uh, is there, are there uh, mutations in the genes that encode these proteins, and do these mutations, uh, are these mutations uh, different in frequency between populations and non populations? Um, so um, again, I mean, this, 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 that, this is important uh, and been proven by um, uh, a clinical proven protease inhibitor. Remember, that this is the, uh, the CD protease. Um, we looked at uh, the, um, the, this particular mutant, um, the 614G, is seen by neutrophil elastase uh, fourfold more efficiently uh, than the B614 that's seen only by centers too. So neutrophil elastase is another protein that actually uh, helps it cleave and helps it cleave more, uh, and uh, some cell, cell, cell line work actually showed that. Um, the higher level of cleavage actually implies that uh, there will be greater uh, level of activation of the spike protein, and that activation will facilitate entry of the SARS-CoV-2 into the host cell. Uh, so the higher the level of neutrophil elastase, the higher level of neutrophil elastase can improve if there is a higher number of neutrophil. So the question is, is there evidence that Caucasians have a higher number of high forms of neutrophils than non-Caucasians, which would mean that in the Caucasian, the virus will be able to enter the host cell and replicate better and therefore infect more and more individuals because uh, per cell they have a larger number of viral, larger viral load and therefore they will be able to infect more and more people. So the question that we ask is, is there evidence that uh, Caucasians have a higher count of neutrophils than non-Caucasians? And the answer is no. We didn't have to do this work because already uh, done by our predecessors uh, who were looking at something else completely and this is work from 2016, they were looking for white blood cell type stuff that's associated with certain immune diseases and what essentially they, they showed is that with respect to neutrophil count, no significant differences were attributable to differences in ancestry and uh, the uh, Caucasian and the Mongoloids have uh, certainly just a completely different uh, ancestry that uh, many of us have exposed uh, to our population network. So then we uh, looked at an inhibitor of uh, neutrophil elastase. So neutrophil elastase levels are small, but is it possible that something that inhibits neutrophil elastase, uh, which uh, is actually leading to uh, the uh, the uh, differential impact of neutrophil elastase, even that neutrophil elastase per se is not different in population and non population So we uh, uh, we knew that alpha one antitrypsin is an inhibitor of neutrophil elastase naturally. Uh, occurring inhibitor, it's produced by the human host cell. Um, the um, uh, alpha 1 antitrypsin inhibits elastase around uh, the normal tissue. It's, uh, it's, there are individuals who have uh, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, and these are individuals who accumulate a lot of fluid in the lungs and so on and so forth. 
in COPD, uh, there is uh, this association with alpha-1 antitrypsin. Won't get into that too much, but one knows that uh, there is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is really uh, a disorder that's caused by mutations in a gene called serpent A1, uh, which is located in chromosome 11. Serpent A1 has actually um, um, has many alleles that produce different amounts of alpha-1 antitrypsin. So there are uh, these, uh, these uh, mutant alleles, um, uh, the M allele is the normal, M allele is the wild type, so to say, uh, that produces normal levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin. But there are two major uh, proteins that are known world over, primarily because of its association with COPD and other lung diseases, uh, the S allele and the Z allele. The S allele produces moderately low levels, and the Z allele produces very low levels of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. And the lower and, and the logic, and, and the, so the MM genotypes uh, produce normal levels of alpha alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, the white type, and one of the two subtypes, uh, mutant types, uh, MS or MZ, they produce slightly different, uh, slightly deficient, and SZ and ZZ are uh, the ones who are deficient, who are really uh, deficient in alpha-1 antitrypsin, and those individuals uh, suffer from various kinds of lung disorders. Uh, lower levels of antitrypsin means lower inhibition of antitrypsin in that case, uh, primarily because alpha-1 antitrypsin is an inhibitor of antitrypsin in that case. So when there is lower inhibition of nitrogen elastase, there is a higher level of available nitrogen elastase, which is said nitrogen elastase activates the spike protein, and therefore there is a greater level of spike protein activation. And then if there is a greater level of spike, uh, spike protein activation, then there will be a higher level of infectivity because the, there will be a greater uh, per, per cell, uh, per lung cell, higher viral load. And a uh, higher level of infectivity will mean better spread in the population. So the better spread in the population is uh, activated by a lower level of, or is associated with a lower level of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And a lower level of antitrypsin is associated with higher levels of uh, mutant alleles S and Z. So that's, that's really the uh, circle that completes the uh, logic. And then uh, if, you can, if you can show that, uh, you know, in, in Southeast Asian populations, the uh, S and Z and these frequencies are mostly different from those in um, the Caucasian population, then this logical circle will be completed, and that might be, provide an explanation as to why uh, in Southeast Asia one finds the uh, uh, the, the, the mutant coronavirus hopping, while in Caucasian populations of Europe and North America one finds that the coronavirus is printing. So we looked at uh, uh, the frequencies of these uh, various. Um, uh, coronaviruses and the same, so this is Europe, uh, the same, uh, Europe, America, and East Asia, uh, and the red ones, the ones that you see in red, uh, the red circles are the ones that belong to uh, the mutant coronavirus, which has uh, glycine at the 614 position, and the green and uh, the yellows, they are, they are the white types of the other, uh, other three. So if you look at um, uh, the lower levels of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, the uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is what we are looking for. Lower levels will mean higher uh, acti activation of uh, uh, neutrophil elastase and therefore better uh, infectivity. So if you look at alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, deficiency, uh, then uh, you find that higher levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in Europe and North America as indicated by these events um, in the width of the red, um, uh, rectangle. Uh, that's the uh, level, so it's about 30% of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient in Europe and North America in the Caucasian population. Contrast that with about 2% uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in Asia. So uh, one, one definitely finds that there is a huge uh, um, level of difference in uh, individuals with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency between the Caucasian and the non-Caucasian. And uh, if you look at it in the country, this is, this is gross, uh, East Asia versus uh, Europe and North America. If you look at it country-wise, you find essentially the same phenomenon. So uh, where, where there is a higher level of alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin frequency, there is a lower inhibition of neutrophil um, uh, of, of, uh, elastase and therefore higher infectivity. So this is, this is essentially uh, what we think is the reason why um, the SARS, uh, mutant SARS-2 coronavirus, the 614B mutant, was able to fare so well in, um, in its spread uh, throughout uh, Europe and North America, throughout the population world, 
compared to um, Europe, compared to Southeast Asia, and um, uh, the non location um, necessities uh, uh, globally uh, in Africa. In, uh, we now have data from Africa, and it's essentially the same story. So uh, this is this is where we think that there is a very nice uh, um, post post African interaction, post viral interaction. The viral virus needs the host proteins for it to uh, enter uh, the human host cell, and uh, that particular entry is also facilitated by and facilitated or retarded by certain proteins that have been produced by the host. So uh, and then once it is produced by the host, the I um, the uh, uh, virus is able to hijack that or use that information uh, to enable itself uh, to make its entry uh, easier into the host cell. Uh, we published this uh, a year ago or earlier this year. Um, and and uh, like I said, I'm going to stop here because I think I'm uh, in my time. Um, so uh, essentially, there are other kinds of variants that are that have arisen uh, during this pandemic. And these variants, again, are the ones that have that had this uh, IC actually fared better than the ones that were not on this IC background, the mutant uh, SARS CoV 2 background that I uh, mentioned. And this actually binds more tightly. The other ones, uh, other mutations, which fit better, they have different kinds of properties. Uh, they did not limit liquid to elastic, but they were able to uh, bind more tightly to the spike proteins. And we know now. How it, bound, uh, how it could bind more tightly to the So there are different kinds of characteristics uh, of these uh, you know, acid alterations that provided uh, different kinds of advantages to the mutant varieties that arose after the uh, 614 gene uh, I'm going to skip this. Uh, so like I said, that uh, we now have a nice model as to what happens in the lungs uh, once the virus enters the, you know, the lungs. Uh, the, the entire process is orchestrated by essentially two proteins. One is uh, AC2 protein that helps to which it binds. And then um, if there is a mutation, then two actors come in. One is the temperate and the other is uh, the elastase. And uh, eventually the elastase uh, uh, is the determining factor whether or not uh, the, the virus will, the, the, the mutant virus uh, will gain its selective advantage by being, by being uh, even enter the host cell better and therefore uh, enable in, uh, in itself to infect um, larger, larger numbers of uh, uh, other individuals and, uh, and the process goes on and the virus then wins over by uh, its ability to transmit uh, very well. So that completes my story and I uh, really thank you uh, for your attention.